so we've been talking in the last handful of weeks, and we'll continue to be talking, about who we are to one another, who we are as a church. And there's this image that kind of repeats and that we keep coming back to of the body of Christ. And I want to start us today just by looking at that image of the body of Christ in like a really, really practical way. Because it started like 2,000 years ago when the body of Christ was Jesus coming and living in a physical human body on this earth, right? And in that time, that body of Christ shared meals with people and cared for people and loved on people and taught people the best way to live. In that time, that that body of Christ, Jesus living in a human body, came and he died and he rose again to give us freedom and to set us free and to lavish grace upon us. And then what happens at the end of that part of the story? That body of Christ ascends into heaven. And then there's like no more body of Christ. And it's like, it's like this weird little moment of, of there's this little pause in history of there was a physical body of Christ on this earth, and then he ascends into heaven. And you can imagine the disciples just looking at him and be like, ah, what do we do now? But uh, that part's over. And then God establishes the next setup where his church, his people are set up as the physical body of Christ on this earth. And I don't think we can take those words too seriously. That that your physical body becomes Christ's physical body, that the things you do can be the things that Jesus does for other people, that you get to be the hands and feet that we always talk about, but you can also be like the laughter or the yard work or the smile or the hug of Jesus. Like you have this ability to be the body of Christ, and, and even more than just you, that we united are the body of Christ. And there's this like beautiful, harmonious image of us all being able to work together of us all being united together, of everything working in this symbiotic relationship of we're, we're so united that it's not even that we're one family, we're like one body. And you can become so enamored of this image that then you actually take a minute and look around the church and you're like, ah, oh, that's not always what I see. Like, like that image of everything working together perfectly can sometimes get in the way of the reality of sometimes you have jagged edges with other people. Sometimes there's people in church who you disagree with. Sometimes there's people in church who you just don't get along with. And that's just like the reality. And that is the community that Paul writes to and what we're going to read today in Ephesians. He writes not to this, like, beautiful, perfectly functioning, harmonious community. I don't know that church. I've never been to that church. He writes to a community of people who are working it out. People who are figuring how to be unified together, and and they are reeling with this new unity that they've experienced in their life. This unity of Gentile Christians being invited in and no longer having to be Jewish Christians. And they're like, I don't know what to do with this thing. These people are different from me, and yet we're supposed to be united. And that is the exact unity that Paul writes to when we look in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. They're reeling with this influx of new ideas, of new ways of living, of just new ways of speaking, and new ways of interacting, and the church growing, and it's creating conflict and change. Like, you guys have been here. That's the church that Paul writes to. Here's what he says. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6, actually, he says this. I, therefore a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and through all. This is the word of the Lord. Paul, Paul starts off this little part of the letter, which he actually repeats, repeated throughout the letter, to, to tell everyone, like, he's, current, he's writing this letter from prison. This is Paul's thing that he writes so that you pay extra attention to what he's about to write because he's proved that he is such a hardcore Christian that he's currently in prison, so, like, you should listen to the thing he says. That's his preamble, and he uses that to set up walk worthy to the calling, like, walk worthy to the calling to which you've been called. Walk in a manner that is worthy And if you could imagine hearing these words as a a Jewish Christian, as a Christian who had been following Yahweh, had been following God your whole life, and you hear these words, walk worthy, you're like, oh, okay, I know how to walk worthy. Like, I I know what God wants for me to be worthy. Like, I I keep myself pure. 
I do all of the things, right? Like I, I, I eat kosher. I make sure that I don't mix things that shouldn't be mixed. I wear tassels to separate myself from other people. Like I make sure that I wash properly before I eat to make sure I like, I don't touch dead things. I know how to walk worthy of this God. Like I know this God, I followed him my whole life. Why don't you guys just follow God like I follow God and then you guys can walk worthy too. Like we'll all work, walk worthy together in this way that I know of keeping myself pure before God. And yet that's not where Paul goes at all. Right? He says, he says, walk worthy to the calling to which you have been called. And this is not like some personal calling that Jesus is telling you to do one thing or, or a calling where the Spirit is telling you. This is the calling to which we have all been called. The calling that every Christian has been called to. It's the same calling that Jesus called his disciples to. Come and follow me. Walk worthy of that calling. And it's not walk worthy of that calling by following the Jewish rites of purity. It's not work, walk worthy of that calling by doing all of the right things so that you can show yourself to be good enough or great enough or grand enough. The way we walk worthy, the way we walk worthy of being brothers and sisters of the king, of being united with the very spirit who is changing this world to be more like his kingdom, to walk worthy of the calling to follow after the one who sets all captives free, is really strikingly not some religious or moral thing. The way that we walk worthy to the calling is we maintain the unity. He, he writes, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. How do you walk worthy of the gospel? You maintain unity. You keep the bond of peace. And, and it's not that what you do doesn't matter. Paul will talk about that at other times. Like, what we do matters. But a lot of times our witness of how united we are is just as important as our witness of, of some of the moral or religious things that we do. And sometimes our witness, the Christian witness over time, has been greatly tarnished by the fact that we are not maintaining the unity to walk worthy in the manner of the calling to which we have been called. And, and if you can imagine yourself in this kind of first century Jew-Gentile community, maybe this is a stretch for you, maybe this feels like you're right at home, but if you can imagine yourself on either side of this unity, like maybe you are a new Gentile Christian who is walking into this community of other believers and you have found Christ to be someone who, who has a calling on your life, like you have found Jesus to be someone who sets you free, who you desire to follow with all of your heart, and yet you walk into this community and there are Jewish Christians who have these other practices that you don't understand. And they find them really meaningful, but you don't really find them meaningful at all. And you like go to their house and you eat differently because you're at their house and that's the way that they eat. Like, like you, you go and, and it feels like they are so focused on things that to you don't even matter, but to them feel like they matter deeply because it helps them respect and worship God. And, and like, you don't understand this and sometimes you're kind of upset by this and sometimes it makes you kind of annoyed at them, but like, you know that you're still united with these people. And then if you think of yourself on the flip side of like you're a Jewish Christian and, and you have been a Jew your whole life and you know God, you know Yahweh, you followed him like since you've been a kid. You know what God likes. You know that this Jesus is the chosen Messiah who is the same God as the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Like you know how to worship him. You, you keep yourself pure and undefiled. Like you follow these, these laws and these codes. Like you, you eat in a certain way, you act in a certain way, you dress in a certain way because it sets yourself apart to be of service to God. And that is so meaningful to you because it helps you connect with God. And then these new Jewish Christians, or these new Gentile Christians come in. And they like, don't worship the way that you worship. And they don't keep the codes that you keep. They don't dress the way that you dress. They don't eat the way that you eat. Like, it feels like some of the things that they do are so missing the reverence that you're supposed to have for God that it upsets you. That how dare they not come before God with more reverence because I know God. I know the way that he likes, he likes to be revered. So why aren't they doing this thing? And yet Paul writes to you and says, keep the unity. You are now united with these people. And I don't know if you can imagine this, but I imagine this unity was at times rather tense. I, I think it was at times rather tense, not because I have some like first century documents about the things that they were going through, but because I've lived that unity my whole life in church. Like, do, don't you know that unity? Maybe you're not like some Jew, Gentile, Christian, but, but this is a unity of new and long-standing followers of God. You know that there's tension there. 
Like this is a unity of people who maybe are more strict or more open, people who fall into kind of relig different religious categories, but it's also like a unity of people from different cultural backgrounds who interact with the world differently, who, who talk differently, who speak differently, and, and who have different hobbies. It's also a unity of people who like, have different personality types. Some of these people coming into the church are people who are jocular and like to make jokes, and some of the people coming into the church are more serious, and, and, and some of the people feel like they need to hold on to some of these practices, and some of the people feel like they need to abandon some of these practices, and those are like all theological and moral things, but then there's also probably just interpersonal issues that arise from this new unity. Like, oh, man, I really don't like Mark. He's a close talker and he has bad breath. This is not you, Mark. This is like, I, I was trying to think of biblical names and it's really hard to think of biblical names in a church because you're gonna call out someone. Like, literally the next name I have written down is Lydia. And it's like, man, I, I really don't like Lydia. Not you, Lydia, but maybe like, a, like an imaginary biblical Lydia. I don't like Lydia because she's argumentative and I just feel trapped when I'm in conversations with her. Again, not this Lydia. We all love this Lydia. Like, I, I don't like Miriam because she tells jokes and they're not funny. And I don't know what to do in that circumstance of like, do I laugh? Is laughing lying? Like, like these, are, these are those types of interpersonal tensions that exist when communities get together. And I imagine they had them because they're people. And, and we have those. And, and into that thing, Paul is not just saying there is this beautiful image of the body of Christ that works harmoniously. No, this is the other side of the body of Christ. That one that you know that like you know that people get under your skin when you're in church and if that hasn't happened to you in church, stick around. Like we'll 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 do that for you. I can do you that service. I'll get under your skin at some point. And into that community that is reeling from this new unity of all of these different people coming in and being united together. Paul writes, "Bear with one another." Like that feels like some sound church advice. Bear with one another. Like you bear, you don't, you don't bear with people who like everything gets along hunky-dory with. You bear with people you disagree with or dislike. And Paul writes to the church, bear with one another, inferring, hey, you're gonna disagree and or dislike one another. That's okay. Bear with each other in love. I instead of letting your disagreements cause rifts and fights and breaks, Bear with one another. Continue to bind back together. And, and the rea if anyone's ever taken a church history class, which if you have, I'm sorry, it was probably long and boring, but it's literally a, a history of rifts and breaks and tears in the church community where we have not born with one another. And, and you know what people outside of church think about people inside of church? We don't do a good, good enough job bearing with one another. Like they see us infighting against each other and it's like, why would I want to be a part of that group? They fight with each other. Like, like, they're always angry inside. Why would I want to be there? And, and it's because our witness of walking worthy to the calling to which we have been called has kind of fallen by the wayside. And yet Paul writes, bear with. And, and this word, bear with, it can also be defined as put up with. It can also be defined as endure. These are not how anyone wants to be described. One dictionary puts it as undergoing something onerous. Like, you gotta love that word, onerous. And, and that word is not describing just something, but that, that word in this circumstance would be describing someone. Like, undergo someone who is onerous. Don't raise hands, but like, have you ever interacted with someone in the church who, you're, no, that person's kinda onerous. Like, they're ornery, I don't, wanna re, I don't wanna be around them. Like, this is the unsexy side of church of bearing with one another to be put up with. And nobody wants this, no one wants to know that they're being put up with or born with or, or, or like undergoing. No one wants to be something onerous, but the reality is like, you have days. You have seasons of life where people undergo you. <laughs> like if you are married, you know that you have seasons where people undergo your presence and they endure because they love you. And that's not what anyone wants to be written on like a birthday card, I endure you. <laughs> but that is such a wonderful witness of love because it is easy to love people who are lovable. 
But when we get together with the church, we find that we are loving people who are broken by sin, just like people outside of the church, and we end up in a position where we must bear with people who are, at times, unlovable. And that's you. I'm not, look, I'm not saying that, like, you're bad people. I, I'm not saying that I haven't come to love being a part of this community, but this is legitimately every church. We go through seasons where we must bear with one another, and we are, I don't know if you felt this, we are that community of a new unity. Like, we are a community of people who wouldn't necessarily gather if it wasn't for the church. And we find ourselves undergoing some of the tame, same tensions and struggles that this Ephesian community underwent, even though we're not Jew-Gentiles. Like, we're a community of, like, boomers and Gen Xers and Gen Zers and millennials or whatever other generations they are. Like, we're a community and a new unity of northerners and southerners. Like, we're, we're a new unity uh, of people who have different political views. Like, we are a new unity uh, of people who are uh, Caribbean Islanders or white bread folks like myself or uh, black Americans or Lat Latinx people. Like, we're a community of all of these different backgrounds. We're a community of people who are more serious and people who are more lighthearted, people who are married or single or previously married or divorced or widowed. Like, we are, we're a community and a new unity of people who interpret the Bible this way and interpret the Bible that way, and that new unity of people creates a tension between people who act this way and act that way, who pray this way and pray that way, like we're people who don't fit perfectly together. We're people who have jagged edges. We're people who tell uncomfortable or unfunny jokes, sometimes from the pulpit. <laughs> Thanks, that's a pity laugh, but I appreciate it. Like, the, that's who we are, and we, it, when, when, when Paul writes, walk worthy to the calling, walk worthy to the gospel, it is striking to me that he doesn't say, walk worthy to the, to the calling, be righteous. He says, walk worthy to the calling, maintain unity, stand together. Like, I love that he doesn't just say, like, be united. Like, when two kids are squabbling, and you're like, sort it out, deal with it, just make it happen. Like, this is not something that someone snaps their fingers. This is not just some miraculous thing that happens outside of your action, maintaining unity. It has this idea of, like, tending a garden. Like, uh, of this thing is, is, is fragile and easy to break, and you need to care for it. You, you know this. If you've been in church, you know that unity doesn't just happen, that it is not the natural byproduct of people getting together. If you've turned on the, no in the news ever, you know that the natural byproduct of people getting together is fighting. Like, that's just the reality of the world that is and the people that we are. And so Paul calls us to maintain the unity. And this is like actual work. Like, you and I know that if we're going to be united with these people in church, like, there's going to be some conversations to be had. There's going to be some work to be done, but it's good work. It's like the work that marriage is, that it's not toil and labor. It is good work that produces a good relationship and that changes you in good ways. When we work to maintain the, the unity in the church, it is good work that builds good relationships and that will, in the end, change you in really good ways. And Paul uses these three words to talk about how we maintain the unity. He, he says that we need to keep the unity in humility and gentleness and patience. The reason they're being is because the opposite of these words breaks communities. Pride breaks communities. Harshness, bullheadedness breaks communities. Rush, unwilling to realize that good things take time, that breaks community. Like these things are church breakers. And, and again, we can read these words through the lens of the new unity that they're experiencing and the unity that you and I are experiencing of being united as one church with people who are different from you in lots of ways. That, that each of these things takes the focus off of myself. That humility, gentleness, and patience take the focus off of proving my way, uh, of achieving my goals, of arguing for my thoughts, of getting my comforts, of speaking my mind. Instead, it focuses on the other person and what they need. Uh, I was reminded this morning in our small group that, that each of these words is, is a compassionate word. It is a word that has to do with feeling for the other person. And, and he starts with humility because it, it shifts the focus off of what I think the right way is for me to listen to other people as if they might be right. And humility doesn't mean that you're dumb. 
Humility doesn't mean that you have bad ideas. It, it recognizes that the person that you're talking to is a person who is bright and clever, made by the same God, indwelt by the same Spirit, and as likely to be right as you are. And so we listen with the assumption that may, they might have the piece of information that I need. And it's the same thing. Humility, when you are frustrated with someone, lets you recognize that it's not that they're a bad person. It's that you have something in you that's getting frustrated in this moment. Humility shifts the focus off of myself and onto them so that I can care for them better. And it's the same with gentleness. Gentleness shifts the focus off of my feelings and what I feel like I should be able to say and what I feel like I should be able to do and shifts the focus onto them and how they might receive it. Them and how my words might hurt or not hurt them. Like, gentleness recognizes that everyone is a person with the same baggage, vulnerability, ability to be upset as I am. And so as I speak to someone and I speak in gentleness, I don't think about just what I want to say and how I can get it off my chest. I think about how they might receive it, that I can keep the unity, that I can maintain the unity. It reminds us that when we are broken down and someone has gotten the most of our patience, they're not a person to be yelled at, but a person who just might be dealing with their own stuff at that moment. And what they need more than us yelling at them or us proving them, proving them wrong is a little bit of space and a little bit of grace. And patience is the same way. It shifts the focus off of my timeline and my goals and my thoughts and what I want the church to be and what I want my life to be and when I want it to be that way and onto the other people and how we can do this thing together and how we can grow together how it takes time for good things to be made, how it takes time to maintain unity, how it takes time to bear with one another. Brothers and sisters, we don't live in this ideal image of the church, of the body of Christ, that we all just operate in perfect unity and harmony. Like, we bear with one another. There are people in this church who you disagree with on things that you think are important. There are people in this church who you honestly just can't find your way to getting along with. And that's okay. One of the best ways that we can show love is by continuing to bear with one another in all humility and patience and gentleness. And, and then, as if this wasn't enough, Paul brings it back to what our foundation is. He uses what might be an early creedal statement in verses 4, 5, and 6, reminding us of what we all hold together. That even if we may diverge in these other things, there, are, there is something more powerful that we all hold together. He writes this. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That even if you disagree or find tension with someone, we have one spirit and one hope and one Lord, and one God, and one baptism, and one Father, like that one Father who is in everything. And so you find yourself, I don't know if you do this, but I find myself with like a little checklist. Like, is that person explicitly following another Lord? No? Then maybe we can be a body together. Like, is that person claiming that they are empowered by another spirit other than the Holy Spirit? No? Then maybe we can be church together. Like, is that person's cultural difference or, or worldview the same as worshiping another god? Is their confrontational nature the same that, as, like, following another spirit? Is what makes me uncomfortable about them the same as them having a different faith? No, then maybe we can be brothers and sisters together who are patient and gentle, who are kind, who bear with one another. That's the reality of the church. Like, we're not some imaginary perfect group. We're a group of people who are different and gather together with, with something that we hold together. And we are united by far, 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 far more than what separates us. And so the question that we ask ourselves is if we are united by all of those things, by one spirit, one father, one Lord, then how can we let anything else, anything else, break the unity that we are called to maintain? Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that you do not leave us alone in this, but work with us. Lord, that we, as your body, work under you. That we are empowered by your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts today. 
or that those things that make us harsh, those things that make us bitter, those things that make us unable to bear with one another or endure one another, Lord, that you would overwhelm us with grace. Lord, let Redeemer Church be a church that walks worthy to the calling that people can see our unity and worship you. In your name we pray.